Hey, Doug. Hey, Lorenzo. How are you? Good and you? Good. That's great. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah. yeah. Can't get together face to face. It has just been nuts lately. I'm worked a long string of nights, and now I flip back to days, and it's crazy. Yeah. So, oh, you're in. You're still in South Carolina. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. So, how's work been? It has been brutal. Um, <laughs> very busy. I've split my time between uh, my community hospital here and the level one trauma center about 45 minutes away and both places are just completely off the chain everything you know overflowing into hallways and yeah it's crazy well um yeah you sound like uh, you've got your plate quite full um yeah, it's, it's but never yeah. a moment. <laughs> and i just uh, i just saw now that um you you released your new book yeah and uh yeah so I definitely want us to talk about that as well. Um, okay. I've been. Uh, let me just give you a bit of a background of uh, how you kind of influenced my life, and uh, thereby, um, and subsequently the you know the life of so many of my clients and the people that I work for, and even people that don't really exercise. When I sort of try to explain to them the the basic tenets of Body by Science, you know, people are far more interested in. Um, you know, finding a method that only requires a short period of time to get really maximum results. And, you know, there's really nothing better than body by science to be able to do that. So, you know, it's been a, you know, I've, 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 I've quite, I've, I've read quite extensively in this field, you know, just like, um, you know, so many other people. And uh, when I stumbled upon your book, and it was, it came actually recommended by, you know, Mark, a friend of yours, Mark Sisson, living in uh, California. And uh, when I started reading his, when I started reading your book, I was just, you know, um, I, I just immediately resonated with me because when in Body by Science, you kind of start immediately by bringing in Nicholas Taleb, um, his concept of the black swan, you know, the standard deviation, st statistical variation. And I was like, wow, that's a brilliant way to really start to... Um, mold people's minds in showing them like, hey, wait a minute, you know, not everything applies to everyone. Um, and uh, if you're going to take exercise advice, make sure you're not taking advice from these genetic anomalies, um, you know, that misguide so many people. And just what a brilliant way to start. But it's very easy to fool yourself, but it's never more true than it is in the fitness. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and just very. Very Absolutely. easy to do. Absolutely. So um, I just want you to sort of tell me a little bit more about, you know, yourself and how you got into um, not only fitness because you are mainly a doctor um, and you're an emergency doctor. Is that correct? That's correct. That's and, my, uh, yeah, my. yeah. And just can you just tell me how, what inspired you to, um, you know, to become not only an authority in emergency medicine, but also in starting to become, you know, in fitness and writing a book and, you know, what, what drove that? What was the driving force behind that for you? Yeah, I mean, in terms of being a physician, the interest in exercise and human physiology definitely predated that and is the reason that I went into medicine. It was sort of a, a deep dive that took on a life of its own. Um, when I was a teenager, when I was 14 or 15, I got involved in racing bicycle motocross, which is a sprint-type race. Yeah. And, um, you know, this before anyone ever really thought about training for sport at all, but, uh, you know, I really was enamored with and loved the sport, but I pretty much sucked at it. <laughs> uh, um, and my brother was taking a weightlifting course at, a, at college and had this Sears barbell set that he had left behind in the garage and the manual that came with it, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I need to, there was this one section of the track that was a hill climb that I just couldn't even make it up. I thought, well, maybe I need to, you know, get stronger, so I'll use this barbell set, and to say that it made a massive difference was just a huge understatement. I was immediately hooked. Yeah. And it made a huge difference in my performance. One day, I was actually out doing sprints on my bike, and I ran into a gentleman middle-aged guy, really jacked, and I was like, ah, who's this? And I went up to talk to him. Turns out he was an owner of a Nautilus studio in the 70s. They were just opening up, and 
popping up like mushrooms everywhere. <laughs> of course, I couldn't afford to go there, but I bartered with the guy, my janitorial services, for working there. And when I was cleaning off his desk one day, I found uh, the Nautilus Training Principles by Arthur Jones. Yeah. And he said, oh, I got plenty of copies. I can take that home with you. And his first book I ever read, cover to cover. Wow. And from that point forward, you know, I was just hooked. And I, I used that training method, and that catapulted me up to the professional level in my sport, you know, further than I ever thought I would go. In the end, oddly enough, um, taking the intensity and the frequency a little bit too high probably damaged my performance in the sport at the, at the higher level. Yeah. Um, but I always stuck with it. I mean, that was always my passion. It's what led me into medical school. I kept training all the way through. But not until, you know, after I was well out of medical school and um, I had a, a military stint to pay back a scholarship, not until I was well beyond that did I finally start thinking in terms of minimal effective dose. That's it. And rather than how much can I stand, how, how little do I require? Yeah. Um, and it, interestingly, it was triggered by reviewing a pharmacology lecture that I had in medical school that sort of got, got me thinking about the minimal effective dose and then kind of going down that pathway which led to body by science. Yeah. I kind of think of um, you know, the dose-response relationship to exercise as a, it's akin to Pareto's law or the 80-20 principle um, as it is applied in economics in the same way you're kind of looking at you know, what's the minimum dose required to produce a particular result. And you know, it, it's very little. It's not a lot, and this is what confuses people. And uh, I, you know, for me, it's kind of like one of the most basic tenets of uh, body by science, that dose-response relationship to exercise. It's just brilliant. And um, I've never seen someone articulate that principle as, as eloquently and as simply as you have in body by science, which makes that book you know, all the more um, enjoyable to read and very practical. Um, yeah. I appreciate it, um, you know, and the ability to articulate it in that way uh, came through the experience of just utterly screwing that up you know? <laughs> um, and, and paying the price for it. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, the old Nautilus was, you know... The more is better. That consists of 15 to 20 movements. Yeah. And it would take you 45 minutes to get through a workout. And, you know, I, at the time I was very hooked on Mike Mincer. And, it was, you know, we thought that more intensity was always better. We were adding forced repetitions, heavy negatives, everything we could think of on top of it. And, um, you know, Arthur Jones at one time just made an offhand comment that, you know, after 72 hours, you'll start to deteriorate. So it was a three-day-a-week thing. Yeah. Period. Traditionally, it still is. Now, kept up with that 15, 20 set, old school, Nautilus, three times a week, the Holy Trinity, no matter what. Yeah. And just drove myself into the ground. I did it all through medical school, you know, working 120 hours a week. So all through residency, 120 how? hours a week, you know, and I just was hammered dog shit <laughs> um, from it. And, you know, until I finally... Um, and it wasn't any discovery on my own part. It was just Ellington Darden back in the mid-90s put out this upside-down bodybuilding, which was based on very abbreviated at the time routines of seven to eight exercises. And I said, well, I'll give this a go. What have I got to lose? And yeah. for the first time in almost you know 15 years, boom, results. Yeah. And it was like, wow. Yeah. And, and that kind of, you know, I, I tend to... Um, how how did you but how did you how, how did you notice that parallel between you know um, fitness and the dose response as it relates to fitness and the dose response as we know in medicine you know with the intensity the volume when did you see those connections when did you make those connections were you the only one or how did that come about no I didn't really make that connection until I started this path of volume reduction yeah and the I would say it's two things. One is the volume reduction produced such an astounding change in my well-being and in actual results where I thought I pretty much tapped out. My genetic potential was as far as I was ever going to go. 
um, all of a sudden, a rate of progress that I hadn't seen since I very first started training again, simply by this reduction in volume. Yeah. Coupled with, um, you know, concurrent with that, I became interested in super slow. And Ken Hutchins had a chapter in the manual for that book where he talked about exercise being able that the main thing that it does is it stimulates. Yeah. It acts as a stimulus upon your body and that your body synthesizes the response. And it's not the exercise directly causing the exactly. ab yeah. roller firms and tightens your yeah. ab. No, exercise does not directly do anything to your body. It delivers a threatful stimulus. Your body then makes the adaptation. Yeah. So combining that notion that biologic equation of stimulus organism response with a review of the dose response relationship in pharmacology, it kind of, the two things clicked in my head and I yeah. thought, this is a, you know, you can apply this to exercise. Yeah. So tell me, how did, how did um, you, how did you know it was time to write that book? Um, is it, is just, did you collect a lot of notes over some time and you thought you really wanted to put something together? Is it some, something people asked you to do? Um, you know, how did you get to know that it was the right time to publish such a book? Yeah, it, well, a couple things happened. First is I actually self-published a book called Ultimate Exercise Bulletin 1 around 1998. Okay, wow. And I had just opened my own training facility. With the same name. Right. Yeah. And was applying um, this very abbreviated type training protocol to my clients, and we were just seeing these really rapid exponential increases in strength yeah. uh, with very low volume, low frequency. We even conducted experiments of pushing it out to every 14 days, every 28 days. And I was just on fire with the whole thing. And I wrote that book um, over the course of a week. Um, <laughs> We wow. went down to the beach. My wife says, you got from 8 a.m. to noon to write. And over five days, I just banged this thing out. Wow. A lot of it was hyperbole. I really went down the slippery slope of, um, you know, intensity, volume, frequency issues. But that was always sort of the catalyst that was in the background for Body by Science coming to fruition. Yeah. Um, Body by Science finally came to fruition for two reasons. One is John Little, um, my co-author, called to ask me a question. And he was hooked in with McGraw-Hill, the publisher, from prior books that he had written. Okay. Just to ask me a question. John uh, Little, he wrote on he, he wrote a lot about Bruce Lee. Is that the same John yes. Little? Same yeah, guy. He's an authorized biographer for the Bruce Lee estate. So yeah. Wow. He's very, very big into that. Um, but he called and asked me a question. We talked, and he's like, crap, we got to write a book. Um, and it just so happened that, you know, I always thought I would like to write a book, but I would like it to be very much something that sampled the scientific literature for supporting evidence rather than just saying, you know, yeah. this is what I say and you better believe it kind of yeah. a religious overtone of the That's book, a, yeah. but an evidentiary overtone of the book. And it just so happened that I think, you know, me and other people kind of shouting from the mountaintops about high intensity and abbreviated exercise was starting to have an effect in academia. And around the early 2000s, um, mid to early 2000s, the literature first started churning out about minimal effective dose type exercise, higher intensity um, and briefer exercise done less frequently, producing the same or superior yeah. results to longer, um, more steady state type exercise programs. And I got to say, for the book, it really could not have been written until about 2009 because okay. the literature that was there to support it wasn't available until that point yeah. in time. I mean, the McMaster study was only published in 2005. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, that's very recent. But phenomenal, you know. It's kind of an explosion of that kind of literature around that time. And, um, you know, I, I had one of my partners, their, their son was in college getting ready to go to med school. And I just gave them an accordion file. <laughs> and I said, 
in any way that you can think of putting in a search engine for high intensity exercise, weight training, whatever it is, and here are all these different categories, you know, yeah. cardiac, respiratory, metabolic, endocrine, you know, bone density. I just made all these tabs and I said, find me all the literature you can get and I will pay you X dollars per hour and I don't care how long it takes you to fill this thing up. And by the time he was done, it was like busting at the seams. Wow. In file from Office Depot full of literature and that's what he <laughs> built the uh, Body by Science off of. Yeah. Um, so how would you, okay, so let's say you are on a bus, you know, taking a tour down somewhere, um, and you want to, you, and someone asks you what you do, like, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Are you, you're obviously you're a parent, you're a doctor, um, you might, you know, you're a trainer, you're all these things, but what, what's the first thing you would tell people that what it is, who you are and what it is that you do? <laughs> <laughs> the, the honest answer is when I'm asked on the bus, I usually just lie. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, depending on who the person is and what That's they're right. Like, yeah. You know, yeah I mean, Let's say it's a stranger. <laughs> but yeah, but if, if someone really wants to know what I do, I mean, the, the honest truth is I make the bulk of my living doing emergency medicine. Yeah. You know, it's hard to. Um, create any sort of entrepreneurial venture and make it make more than my medical career does. But I like to tell people that I work on two opposite ends of the health delivery spectrum. On one end, hmm. I work in this place that is full of the sickest people you can imagine that are 35 to 40 years complicit in the demise of their own health. Wow. They come to me in the 11th hour with the wheels coming off, and i got to save them. <laughs> and that is a very emotionally grueling and physically taxing job that's hard to carry on for the long term without some sort of outlet. And my outlet is the absolute antithesis of that. Yeah. I take people who are the 1% or the people that really do understand that they have to be active in the production of their own health. And they're willing to pay the price. And they're willing to pay me good money to hurt like hell for 15 to 20 minutes um, in order to stimulate the type of yeah. health benefits that they're yeah. seeking out. Well, there's a line in your book, and it really that's the one that really gets to me. And it's the one thing I, I really took away from the book probably the most. And it said... That strength training is the best preventative medicine in which a human can engage. Yeah, and without, that's true. You know, and, the, and even now, I mean, I could write an entire other book on the literature that has occurred in the past five years that bears that out. I mean, there's so much of what was going on in and around the writing of that book that fell into the category of things I believe that I cannot prove that now have been scientifically validated. The yeah. skeletal muscle is so much more than movement generating tissue. Um, and it produced beneficial effects that were far disproportionate to the simple changes that occurred in uh, energy economics. Yeah. Uh, you know, the in out kind of, um, energy accounting type things. It was way beyond that. It was self-evident to anyone that went in a gym and looked at the people that were on the treadmills and looked at the people that were in the weight area and, you know, what their health status looked like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and what we're finding out is that skeletal muscle is the most profoundly active endocrine organ in the body. And that as it tracks along in terms of its health, Everything else tracks along. Yeah, I had an amazing experience a few weeks ago. I had um, a woman that was traveling through our area was in a car wreck, and I had fear that you know, she might have had a liver lack or a ruptured spleen, internal injury. So we ended up doing a CT scan. This woman was a seventy-one-year-old female bodybuilder. And the amazing thing was not simply her muscle mass or how little subcutaneous fat she had, but 
you know, the CT scan takes um, transverse slices through the body from the feet up to the head, sort of like slices in a, a spiral cut ham. Yeah. You look at it, each individual slice as it goes through the organ. And the thing was, this 71-year-old woman had the organ mass of a 20-year-old. Her kidneys were huge and plump. Her liver was homogeneous and solid. I mean, her spleen was not all pockmarked. Her butt wow. dense was outstanding. There was not a single vascular calcification in any of her major blood vessels. Um, and that just goes to show you that um, skeletal muscle is more than just the engine of our body. It is, yeah. it, as its health tracks, everything else follows suit. Yeah. It's just a sound. Yeah. So, okay, so let's say you were to um, put in, in a few minutes, let's say three minutes, you had to explain what body, what are the basic tenets of body by science and uh, um, what, what's the most, what's the most, you, um, what's the thing that comes up the most about having written the book and how it is that you try to communicate the most basic tenets um, of the book to others, not in terms of selling it, but in terms of communicating its, its ultimate worth or value for people in terms of improving their health and fitness. How would you, how would you put that in, you know, a few minutes or less? Yeah. First is that exercise is a stimulus. Exercise doesn't do anything that produces a direct change in your body. And this stimulus, um, the only way to get at all these subsystems of your body to produce an adaptive change is by doing mechanical work with muscle. muscle. Yeah. The higher the quality of that mechanical work, the better the stimulus. Okay. And if you deliver that stimulus to the mechanical, that mechanical stimulus through muscle to the body, um, all of your metabolism is affected. Yeah, that's incredible, it's actually. A segment of metabolism, but what we call global metabolic conditioning. conditioning. Yeah. And when you do that, you affect through myokines. We now know we didn't know at the time, but through myokines, chemical messengers released by exercising muscle. You positively affect every organ and tissue within your body. <laughs> and it is doing so not just on burning calories or any sort of, um, there's not a little accountant in a short sleeve shirt and a tie inside your body keeping track of everything. It's done through biological signaling. <laughs> and this is the mechanism to send the correct signal to, to your body to adapt and optimize every aspect of your health. Yeah. It's just a fulcrum point from which you can leverage all the health benefits that you would ever want. Yeah. So explain to me the dose, re the dose response relationship to exercise. For those, for those who are watching and want to get a better idea, um, how, would you, how would you explain the, the dose, re dose sure. response relationship to exercise? Sure, exercise or a drug. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you are delivering a stimulus to the body. Yeah. For that stimulus to trigger an adaptive change, you have to cross some threshold of intensity for that stimulus to be meaningful enough for your body to bother making the adaptation. Huh. Okay. So the dose-response relationship is, number one, you've got to get the intensity high enough to actually trigger an adaptation. And then, at a given level of intensity, you have to find an optimal dose. Yeah. And you want to reach the highest stimulus intensity that you safely can, because as you do so, as the intensity is increased, whether that's drug or exercise, the volume that can be tolerated goes down. And also, the dosing interval that becomes necessary widens. So if you're going to, if you're a pharmaceutical manufacturer and you want to make a drug that's going to target a certain effect, you want the drug to have a high stimulus intensity so it reliably produces the therapeutic effect. And 
that stimulus intensity also creates the widest dosing interval possible. Because if you can sell a drug that you only have to take once every 24 hours, <laughs> as opposed to one that you have to take every six hours yeah. or five times a day, efficacy and compliance are going to go way, way up. And the same is true of exercise. Yeah. We want to refine the exercise stimulus so that all of the mechanical work of exercise is focused on producing the stimulus, which is the rapid and deep fatigue of skeletal muscle. Now, you can do a lot of work, a lot of mechanical work. You can, you know, drag your SUV up the driveway. You can push a sled with weights on it. You can do a lot of mechanical work without necessarily producing much inroad or depth of fatigue. Yeah. What we want to do is we want to do the type of mechanical work that focuses all of that effort on producing fatigue within the skeletal muscle because that is the stimulus. Hmm. If you fatigue to a certain depth, your body started at a certain level and ended up at a certain level, its adaptive response is, well, next time I'm going to be this much stronger. Yeah. So for that depth, again, I have some reserves. But over time, you keep escalating the dose intensity so that you can keep provoking the adaptive response. Hmm. So what would that look like in a practical setting? Um... Well, in our setting, in the, in the gym that I train, it's a handful of exercises that cover the entire body. So in Body by Science, we use the big five, which is, you know, a, a compound rowing motion, a chest press motion, a pull-down motion, a overhead press motion, and a leg press. So practically speaking, those five exercises. Yeah. But, okay, well, before you carry on, um, yeah. whenever I tell people 12 minutes a week, they think I'm crazy. They just yeah. think it's no way that can be enough. So why 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 can twelve minutes be enough in a week and in some cases even a month? Why is that? Why could that be enough? Because the stimulus intensity is high. Yeah. It's the thing that people can't wrap their brain around because they've never experienced it firsthand. And that <laughs> is key to get buy in. Okay. Yeah. Because so much of what people do as exercise is really just activity. And any exercise stimulus that occurs is simply a side effect of that activity. It occurs almost by accident. What we're doing is very deliberate. We can take all the workload of your average gym rat, reduce that down to 10% of the total workload, and get more stimulus than a guy that's been in the gym for two and a half hours. Exactly. Because we're focusing all of the mechanical work on producing the stimulus, which is that depth of fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the way that we have to overcome that, because we face the same thing that you do all the time. People just cannot believe it. It's a gimmick. It's bull crap. You yeah. know, it's, it just doesn't pass the sniff test. So what you got to do is you got to say what? I don't expect you to take my word for it, but if you will let me demonstrate it to me to you, you will understand. And when you do it properly, they understand within the first 90 seconds. Yeah. That's 90 just... seconds in, <laughs> they have this appreciation of, oh my God, there is no way I can make it to the 12-minute mark. Yeah, absolutely. I remember the first time I took, you know, your words, put it into action in the gym and, uh, you know, granted I was doing it only with body weight because I didn't have machines at the time, but I kind of adapted the five or the three um, exercise model to, you know, five exercises with body weight with a pull-up and uh, we'll get to that just now because I want to ask you on, you know, what are, what are ways we can take, you know, some of the big five or big three and how we could turn that into or make it applicable to people that travel often or don't always have access to machines or things like that. But I remember the first time, you know, I did it. Um, I think my the pull-up was the first exercise, and uh, it was I'd lasted about 90 seconds. I added some weights, and uh, I just couldn't believe. I came down from the bar, and I was out of breath. You know, like the that mechanical work with muscle produced such a heavy response 
metabolically and cardiovascularly like I couldn't breathe and I was thinking what I still have to do all these other you know the squat and all these other exercises afterwards I just that's a thing people have to experience it for themselves because I was on the floor after the fifth exercise kind yeah. of addicted to it because it was it's incredible really it's like you said yeah. it's deliberate it's really quite a simple manipulation to get there yeah it is is you really are focusing the modality on producing the fatigue rather than extrinsically approaching, you know, doing X weight for X number of reps and repeat. Rather than doing that, you're focusing on um, staying under continuous load and driving a deep level of fatigue. Yeah. I, and, and I guess the best way to explain it is I did an observational experiment. A, a lot of times my you know, I got this rotating ER schedule, and my personal training center a lot of times is booked up. So if I got a day off where I can train, I call down there like, man, sorry, we're booked up. So I'll go over to the local university gym, do work out over there. So one day when I'm over there, I have my stopwatch. I'm like, so I'm just going to watch your average bodybuilder type meathead in the gym doing a workout. I mean, this <laughs> college guy doing his workout. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record their time under load cumulatively. So they, they, you know, they go to the dumbbell rack and they pick it up. They do some overhead presses, you know, one, two, three, four, and you run the stopwatch and you click it, sets over in 15 seconds, 18 seconds. Then they walk around they yeah. on their iPhone a little exactly. bit. They talk yeah. to their friends. They go to the water fountain. They stare at some chick's ass for a little bit, and then they come back and do it again. Yeah. And they start the stopwatch again once they're under load again. Now, this guy hangs out, and he does a, a, quote, workout in the gym. He's there for an hour and a half. But the cumulative time under load where he's actually doing productive work that's producing muscular fatigue, when you tally up the total of his hour and a half in the gym, it's about half of the time under load. Yeah. And I get for my clients in a 12 to 15 minute workout. Yeah. So basically, you know, a really well done workout is just like any other workout, only you just eliminated all the screw around time. Yeah. And you and focus really on what the stimulus is, and that's producing fatigue. And I th it's kind of like people don't get it because they, if people don't really induce a deep enough inroad, and thereby they can still go back to the gym because when you do train at that level and you cause a deep enough inroad, that there's just no way you can be back in the gym at the same level the next day. And, yeah. you know, that just speaks of uh, it, that people don't push themselves or train at that intensity to begin with. Which brings me to my next question, and that is, how come, I mean, you're, you're obviously well aware of the CrossFit craze and how they train and, you know, their high-intensity functional movements – um, how, how do you reconcile the body by science tenants and the slow method training with, with the, with, with, with CrossFit? Um, I guess first I got to predicate by saying is that, um, in a perverse way, I'm kind of a fan of CrossFit. Yeah. Um, I like you know, I just like their political, philosophical orientation of being very pro-free market and that kind of thing. I enjoy that. I think where we differ, and, and I can take any CrossFitter that can really feel like they got a hard metabolic hit from doing Fran or something of that nature. Yeah. I can bring any CrossFitter into my gym, and I can put them on the carpet. Okay? <laughs> and that's not... To say that my workout's hard, it's not. It's just not rocket science to put someone on the carpet. I can put anyone, if I choose the right movements and the right pace and the right motivation, I can put anyone on the carpet. I can make anyone vomit in the trash can. That's like shooting fish in a barrel. It is yeah. not a problem to do that. Yeah. Okay. The difference between CrossFit is they have embraced this notion of functional training, as if doing something with a barbell because it's somewhat more primitive than an exercise machine will translate better into exactly. real life stuff. And yeah. then their confirmation for that is, 
well, we'll test our strength with a snatch or a, you know, well, that's what you're training and that's what you're testing with and that's what you're defining as functional, you know, it seems sort of circular. Um, but what they're doing is they are doing a high level of metabolic and mechanical work. But they're doing it extrinsically for okay. performance reasons. Yeah. Race against the clock, number of repetitions, one guy against another, with no eye towards what is this doing in terms of producing the stimulus, which is this deep level of fatigue. Yeah. Here it occurs as a byproduct with a whole lot of mechanical work that takes a toll on recovery and more importantly takes a safety toll both acutely and chronically and with the stimulus portion of the exercise occurring as a side effect of all that. It's just that they apply so much of it that they're able to get enough of the stimulus but in so doing exposing yourself to a lot of danger. Yeah, that's Dude, exactly what it's I mean, yeah. That's evident. That's evident. You can see it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Olymp Olympic lifting, for instance, is a sport. And it is meant to be practiced in a completely fresh state for these single attempt lifts. To yeah. do that repetitively as a fatiguing protocol for something that requires so much um, technique and coordination. Yeah. And in movements that, despite being defined as functional, put you in very unnatural, non-functional joint positions that are very, very vulnerable with long lever arms and large amounts of weight on the end of that lever, as you fatigue, it's not a matter of if you're going to get hurt. It's just yeah. a matter of when and to what degree. Exactly. And the thing is, is it doesn't have to be acute. You can do things like this for years, and then 5, 10, 20 years down the road, you got a frozen shoulder. Yeah. Or your rotator cuff has gone out. Yeah. Or your meniscus is torn, or your ACL is blown out, and you're like, why did that happen? <laughs> yeah. And not realizing that it's not just yeah. the acute stress, but the accumulative stress that led up to that. I remember being completely pro machines in the gym and then you know I kind of I was taken by the whole CrossFit storm and I got into the community for a while and uh, I opened my own gym where it was kind of like um, we did personal training and we did CrossFit and then uh, when I read your book all of a sudden I shifted my mind once again to being pro machines because I finally got it I finally I finally got why um, how you can manipulate a targeted response without the wear and tear um, byproducts of and um, that you get with loose, you know, with, with free weights. Can you just explain um, why it is that you would prefer machines in that context? Well, I don't necessarily. In the book, we chose to focus on machines for the simple fact that when we want a person that's reading the book to go after the stimulus. Yeah. I want all their concentration available to do the to do hard, intense work. Yeah. And not have much of their consciousness devoted to stabilizing or balancing or nation stabilization, yeah. stuff like that. But that doesn't mean that machines are better than free weights. No. Free weights are better than machines, yeah. or that either are better than none. Yeah. I can completely get an awesome workout or decimate a client with no weights whatsoever. Yeah. Okay? The difference is the focus and the intent. The intent is internalized. It is to use whatever resistance by whatever form as a mechanism to generate intense muscular contraction, which therefore generates a deep level of fatigue, yeah. which is the stimulus for biological adaptation, okay, as opposed to these other approaches, and I won't name CrossFit in particular, just these other approaches, whether it be CrossFit, P90X, Insanity, fill in the blank, is basically getting at that stimulus by throwing dog shit at a screen door and hoping something useful lands on the other side. 
<laughs> and then the emphasis becomes to throw that dog shit really, really hard so something good comes out the other side of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Whereas so. mine is a much more focused approach that kind of understands the biology of and the physiology and the biomechanics all together. We're not going to put you in vulnerable joint angles. We're going to do things, you know, that produce this deep level of fatigue without massive unnecessary workloads and without exposure to enough force to hurt you. Because really, the adaptation we're trying to do is to improve your functionality, improve your health. Yeah. And whether you want to call, you know, snatching or power cleans or whatever functional or not, you know, if you blow out a disc, or if, like one of the competitors did, you get that overhead and you drop it, and it lands on the junction between your T and L spine, and you sever your spine, being wheelchair bound for the rest of your life, my friend, is not functional. Yeah. <laughs> Blowing out your rotator cuff is not functional. Yeah. Hurting a disc is not functional. Yeah, absolutely. And when the end result <laughs> undermines the intended... Um, outcome outcome you know what's the point yeah well it's like you said um in your definition of exercise that it's you know it's directed activity um that stimulates the body to produce a positive adaptation in your health and fitness and to do it in a way that your health is not you know to do to do it in a way that your health is not undermined in the process of trying to you know improve your fitness because right. that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of people trying to get fit, but really undermining our health. And I'm glad that we're on that. Because can you just can you just finally delineate the difference between health and fitness? Because this is something people think that track together. And as you beautifully demonstrated, and that I intuitively know doesn't. Can you just kind of touch on that a bit? Yeah, I mean, we people conflate those terms a lot, and they're not the same at all. No. Yeah. Um, so. So health, um, you have to define basically as the absence of disease, um, that you are in a normal functional physiologic state. And fitness, I like to define as physiologic headroom. And that's a... What's that? that physiological what? Headroom. Headroom, yeah. Okay, that's kind of an area under the curve kind of analysis. And... Arthur Devaney, kind of one of the fathers of that whole paleo movement, paleo, yeah. came up with that term, and I love it. Physiological and basically headroom. what it is, is it defines the difference between the least you can do and the most you can do. So fitness is how much physiologic headroom you have. Most people over time, they're, the most they can do declines over time rather precipitously yeah. until the day when the most you can do equals the least you can do, that's called dead. Okay? So what we want in fitness is to maintain that physiologic headroom over the span of someone's lifetime. Okay? There are lots of very accomplished Olympic lifters. There are almost no Olympic lifters that are 40 years old or older because the injuries accumulated from that activity have shaved off their physiologic headroom. Yeah. Um, so what we want is the story of the one horse Shay, the, the animal that functions at this very high level across his entire lifetime until all of a sudden just drop dead at still peak physiologic functioning. Yeah. Would and you... that is what fitness is. Yeah. Would you Have say this high physiologic headroom? So this headroom, would you say at the bottom of the headroom is the baseline? Yes. Okay. And uh, so... In terms of what you can generate in terms of output, consider yourself in stage four really, really deep sleep right prior to rain. This is like as is, is sedentary as you can possibly be. Yeah. That is the baseline. <laughs> and the maximal output that you can achieve in any given realm is your physiologic headroom. And is that's that what we're trying to generate is the adaptive response. Okay. So is there is, so is there a way to measure that that physiological headroom? Um, not in any quantitative objective way because it depends on what it is you want to use as your measuring tool. Right. Then 
this physiologic headroom has specificity to it. Yeah. You can get very well conditioned doing body by science. And if you want to express your physiologic headroom by running a 10K, well, you're going to have to practice that activity. <laughs> right. But the amount of practice and the amount of time it takes you to get to your peak level for running that 10K, if you've done a body by science type conditioning program, yeah. is going to be very, very short and very brief. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a running course that I used to run around my neighborhood, and I know what my fastest time ever was. And I can lay off for months or years, and within a few weeks, you know, within really probably five to ten days um, of just kind of rehearsing and getting back into it, I can be back to my fastest time ever. It doesn't yeah. take months and yeah. months. And that's the difference. It's kind of like maintaining a general headroom for all these specified right. um, yeah, tasks. And if you want to measure your physiologic headroom in some specific way, you can practice whatever that is and get there relatively quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the, another striking thing about, you know, body by science is that fitness is, more, it's not really a central adaptation, that it's more of a peripheral in terms of muscle, um, 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 you know, a musculoskeletal kind of adaptation rather than a cardiorespiratory adaptation. Um, why is that? Well, you know, at the time we largely thought that it was just the mechanical advantage of being stronger. So if you're going to do any given task, it's going to require a certain number of units of work output. So let's say a given person is going to climb up a flight of steps, and that takes 100 units of work. Yeah. And in the muscles involved, each motor unit produces one unit of force output. So in order to accomplish that task, you're going to have to recruit 100 motor units. Well, let's say you go on a proper strengthening program, and all of a sudden, each of those motor units now produces two units of force. Well, now, to accomplish that 100-unit task, you only have to recruit 50 motor units instead of 100. Hmm. So all of the subsystems that have to support that are only tasked at a level of 50 instead of 100. And that was the thought behind why the peripheral adaptations matter so much. Yeah. What the science is now bearing out is that a lot of what we assume was just that is really this myokine effect. The fact that muscles um, generate so many of these biologically active messengers, these cytokines, which are now termed myokines, um, has beneficial effects on other tissues through an endocrine-type signaling mechanism. So it's basically just that skeletal muscle is a window to the body that allows all these things to do. But, but in the book, the purpose of discussing that was to get away from this notion that came from all of the aerobic exercise. That's it, yeah. Search and philosophy that has accumulated over the years that it was all about the heart and blood vessels. That somehow magically doing low-intensity steady-state exercise somehow isolated out the aerobic subsegment of metabolism which existed in the mitochondria. Heart and lungs. somehow yeah. that was directly linked to the heart and blood vessels and it produced a beneficial effect. When in fact that conclusion was only reached because the only measuring tool they had was VO2 max. <laughs> and when your only tool was a hammer, the whole world became a nail. And that's how they interpreted everything. Yeah. Um, when in fact... You know, there's no way that the heart and blood vessels are just hooked up to the mitochondria doing aerobic yeah. metabolism. In fact, the mitochondria are organelles in the cell in that the, really, in the cell. from an evolutionary standpoint, were protobacteria that were symbiotic organisms living inside cells that ate their waste product of anaerobic metabolism. So, from an evolutionary standpoint, our aerobic metabolism runs off the fuel that is delivered by the anaerobic subsegment of metabolism. Exactly. So the only way yeah. that yeah. you can ramp up your aerobic metabolism yeah. is to ramp up your anaerobic metabolism and deliver more substrate. Which is why you can do a 90-second pull-up, get off the bar, and be out of breath completely. 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> if someone thinks that there's value in a steady state exercise that runs pyruvate into the mitochondria at a slightly elevated rate for two hours, then guess what? You do a high intensity workout for longer than that afterwards. Yeah. You're doing exactly that while you're sitting in your chair or driving to and from or out shopping or whatever. So what does your work workout look like today after years of refinement? What is your work, a, sort of an overview of your workout today? What does it look like? Um, it's still, you know, it's high intensity strength training um, rather than a big five workout because as you get stronger, you can actually bring more punishment to yourself in yeah. terms of physiologic demands and workload. Huh. So I subdivide my workout into a quasi-split routine. It still covers the whole body, but it's sort of a, a chest, back, legs, and then a shoulders, arm, leg kind of thing. Um, so for chest and back, let's see what I do last time. I did a pull-down. I did a compound row. Oh, I did a pull-down. I did chest press. I did compound row. And I kind of you uh, neck think, flexion, neck extension, and leg press. That's on your uh, <laughs> Instagram. I think that's on your Instagram yeah. at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> like you watch Instagram, um, which is ultimate underscore exercise underscore is the ha is the hashtag or whatever for that. Yeah, people can you get a good idea. Stay in order one yeah. day by the next. What workout I did that week. How would you adapt your workout to a body weight? Let's say you were traveling or you didn't have access to um, any kind of equipment or machines. What, what would a body by science applied body weight workout look like? Um, well, for one, you're going you're gonna to have to do something to get a meaningful resistance out of not having weights. Yeah, so it's, it, do you, it has its limitations in a way. Sort of, but yeah. um, you can get around those limitations by incorporating some fatiguing protocols to make your freehand exercise more demanding. Yeah. So, um, if you go to Walmart and you buy a set of yoga blocks that have a strap, you're good to go. That's all you need. Okay. So, um, that strap, for instance, rather than leg press, what you can do is you can open that strap up almost as wide as it goes. You can step on top of the strap, squat down, and pull the strap over your mid thighs. Okay, I see. So that you have an isometric apparatus. You're yeah. standing in the loop of that strap, but it's keeping you from going anywhere. Yeah. So what we do then is a timed static contraction protocol. So for 20 seconds, you're going to contract against that strap with what you perceive is 50% effort. Okay. And then once you get to that 20-second mark, you gradually ramp your effort up to 75%. So from second 21 to 40, you're putting out 75% effort. Between 41 and 50, I want you to give 95% effort. And between 51 and a minute, Hard as you can. Yeah, that's that's is that still within ninety second protocol. Yeah, would that still be ninety seconds? Yeah, that's sixty. That's twenty twenty twenty. Okay. Yeah. Um, which is necessary because the rate of fatigue using time static contraction is actually faster than when you're lifting. Okay. It, so, it's a, it will be astounding to you, I promise. So so instead uh, of could you do the same like, thing with a pull up like holding? Would you just well, hold it or you? I mean, because. Pull up, I mean, depending on how heavy you are. Uh, yeah, most people, chin-ups or pull-ups are plenty hard enough without having to, to worry about that at all. Yeah. If you need to pre-fatigue it, then I recommend a time static contraction pullover type movement. And that can be done just on the edge of the table with your elbows pulling into the table. As if you're doing a pull-down, but your elbows are hitting the table. Yeah, it's like so an isometric contraction. 75%, 100% um, as a pre-fatigue. But the interesting thing is that 100%, your force output is actually, when you finally hit that 100% period, your force output is actually much less than it was at 50% effort when you were fresh. Okay. 
As a matter of fact, most people will have a hard time staying upright or keeping their thighs in contact with the belt anymore. Immediately after that, you can step out of the belt and then do freehand squats, and you'll be lucky to get a handful of repetitions <laughs> because of the fatigue. Okay? Um, the yoga blocks, you can place those between your legs and do a thigh adduction, adduction, same protocol, 50%, 20 seconds, 75%, 20 seconds, 95%, 10 seconds, wow. hard as you can, 10 seconds. Yeah. You can put the strap around your legs and do an abduction protocol. Um, you can use the yoga blocks, both of them between your arms, to do a chest fly, time squeeze. static contraction. Yeah. Squeeze hold. together, 50%, 75%, 100%. Immediately drop the yoga blocks, then do your push-ups yeah. as your chest exercise. Do you, do you have a body weight resource for Body by Science? Because I know so many people that would benefit from that. No, but if people keep an eye out on the YouTube channel, there's a link to the YouTube channel on my yeah. current blog post at bodybyscience.net. Uh, I'll put some. I'll, I will do one of these workouts, video recorded, and put it up so people can see, you know, how you can do this in your hotel room or at home without yeah. any equipment whatsoever. Yeah, because I'm, I'm most of my clients that I used to work with um, when I started, you know. We started with functional training and we did so many different things, you know, free yeah. movement. And uh, when I started getting them on the slow training or the body by science training protocol, um, a lot of them travel and it was very difficult for them to, um, you know, do it with machines or do it with any kind of equipment. So they're, they're always asking me, you know, how can I adapt this kind of slow training with yeah. body weight? And I show them some basics, you know, things that I do. Yeah. But There's a great resource for you is um, there's a fellow named Drew Bay. Yeah, I knew about, I know about Dre, yeah. He's got a new book out on body weight and time static contraction training. It's an ebook. You can download it straight off the internet. Okay. Just go to bay.com, B A Y E.com, and you can download that there. But I will put up on a YouTube video soon. That'll be great. I mean, if you can send that. Yes. Yeah. I, mean, um, I got to give you a heads up. I got a phone consult that I got to do right at four o'clock so we're gonna have to shut it down here shortly so okay cool can you just quickly talk about your new book um what's it called yes yeah, so uh, description is put out through uh mark sisson's publishing company company um primal blueprint publishing so in a nutshell the book is this is number one how the united states and really united kingdom any other um healthcare system in the western world is screwed up in the same way how through government manipulation and the disallowance of the effect of a free market, healthcare got so messed up. Yeah. Um, and that's the first half of the book, and it's very detailed and very informative. The second half of the book is, because it is so screwed up, how to stay out of the belly of that beast. Okay. And then finally, if you do get pulled in, here is how to navigate your way through the system in a way that you can extract the best that it has to offer because it does have a lot of amazing stuff to offer. But while avoiding the darker sides of this really Byzantine healthcare system that we're dealing with nowadays. Wow. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I can't wait to get it. Is it, where is it, is it available at the moment? Yeah, it is. It's yeah. in all major bookstores. It's Primal Prescription. It's me, Doug McGuff, and Bob Murphy, and a uh, really fantastic economist is my co-author. You can get it in all the major bookstores. You can get it at Amazon. Just plug in Primal Prescription, hit go, and it'll cool. be there. I'm, uh, I'm definitely, I'm sure so many of my... Uh, you know, clients and friends um, are going to jump right onto that because uh, they, you know, they just really love Body by Science. Um, yeah. So, yeah, thank you so much for, for your time. I really yeah, appreciate yeah. it. Really and uh, thank you so much for take, taking the time to write the book. You know, I always say that, you know, if it's difficult to, you know, it's one thing to do to produce great work and work with sharing, but it's another thing to put yourself out there and to take the time for that because it's not always easy and it's not always viable. Um, yeah. So I just want to thank you for for putting yeah, yourself out there. You, and someone that does do that and writes books, I got to tell you, when people say that, it means more than you could ever imagine. Yeah, it does. And I thank you for it. Yeah, thank you so much, and I uh, hope to speak to you soon again. All right, we'll do. Look forward to hearing this. Okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye.